Um, welcome uh, to the ACT chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association. Um, the, uh, what for the presentation by uh, Dr. Michael Mulvaney on the potential roles and benefits of, that citizen scientists can bring to post fire monitoring and survey. Shortly, I'll, I'll will introduce you to Michael, but first some housekeeping. Please ensure that you remain muted throughout the presentation. Also, for bandwidth considerations, please consider turning off your video uh, if it is on. If you have any questions, can you please enter them in the chat um, and we will address them at, towards the end of the, um, the presentation. Uh, and any that we don't get to, Michael's agreed to put pen to paper or finger to keyboard and we'll uh, send the answers out via email. Um, please note that the session uh, is being recorded and I'll make the recording of the session available. Uh, after this. Moving on, it's my pleasure to introduce to you those that don't already know, Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Mulvaney. Michael is employed as a senior conservation officer in the ACT government to provide wildlife advice into planning, development and management decisions. He has the help um, of over 4,000 citizen scientists who have added considerable, considerably to the knowledge of the distribution and abundance of wildlife in the ACT and have done the bulk of the research in relation to studies on gang gang and small ant blue um, butterfly ecology, visitation by pred predators and hollow nest com um, competitors to the superb parrots, uh, superb parrot nest hollows uh, and fire response of local orchid species. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you everybody for coming in on a cold night and a football night. I very much appreciate you being there. Um, I'm, my expertise is wildlife and that's what I'll basically be talking about, citizen science projects dealing with wildlife, which I gather make up about 80% of the citizen science projects that Australians are involved in. And I think our response to, the citizen science response to fire is pretty typical of the response that, that we have or, or the effort that going, that's going on in citizen science at the moment. And the way I describe it is that there's a really lot of good stuff going on, but we're really only the tip of the iceberg of what could happen. And the argument that I'm putting tonight is that the, the next stage for us to move is really a collaboration with the paid scientists. And I think that once that gets going will really be gangbusters. In terms of the uh, the um, response that citizens had to fire and po the post fire response, the biggest action that people did was actually put out water for uh, wildlife that had been affected by the fire. Now, one of the, the leaders of this group, she described what they were doing as organised chaos. And basically, that's pretty well what it was. Um, people did sign up to locate where they were putting um, all sorts of plastic containers containing water. And literally, we had thousands of containers uh, put out all over areas that have been burnt. Um, and people engaged with each other and, and really the main purpose for showing where you were putting yours was so that there was this total coverage and that you could uh, basically motivate and encourage each others. And when you look behind you, why were people putting out that water? It's because they have a, a joy in the natural world and, and a wonder and struck by the awe of it and, and really just love the bush. And when something like a fire happens, have a real sense that they'd like to do something for that wildlife that they love. And so they have a sense of care. And actually in doing that action, they're also looking after their own well-being. So they're feeling better about it and they're sharing the task. So it's a pretty shared task, but it's a pretty chaotic class. Some of the burnt areas, they were a little bit more organised and they actually said, well, these are the watering spots that we're putting out to wildlife. Let's put some cameras up to see what comes there. And the Greater, uh, greater Sydney uh, uh, Land and uh, Services, would have actually call themselves, put out 120 drinking bowls across the Greater Sydney area. 
and they say they had hundreds of individual animals, which means that only they got you know four or five animals at each drinking bowl, and they only got twenty native species overall. So it makes you wonder, actually, if you just put cameras up there with the even without water, you would have got the same pictures of wildlife. Um, and there wasn't any questioning about it doesn't actually make a difference and there wasn't really any testing. So there was no matched places where similar containers were put out without having water. And there was no really sort of scientific analysis to find out, are we actually making a difference by putting the water out there? Um, the one in uh, Shoalhaven basically was going down that, that path, but then they had heavy rain. So it sort of, um, that was the end of, of that activity. If we contrast that with paid scientists, um, they're basically, instead of using language of love and joy, they're using language of reason and calculus. And they're basically out to test a question about the environment. And they're trying to get understanding by testing a null hypothesis and asking a specific question. And yeah, they're, they're putting it through um, a, a set design and using statistics to come out with an answer. So there's almost like two different languages between the citizen science scientists and the paid scientists. Now, I don't think one's better than the other or actually one produces better science than the other. I think both have strong points and weaknesses and I think the task ahead of us is to actually take the best of both worlds and, and, and really make some good science. On the uh, 15th of January, the uh, Minister for, the Commonwealth Minister for the Environment, uh, Karen Andrews, she, uh, probably in the response of all the flack that the Prime Minister was getting about climate change and not listening to science, but she came up, um, Basically, she had a round table of professional scientists. And after that, she announced that she, they were going to put together a, um, a science-led response to bushfires and their impacts. And part of that round table basically said, we need to include the energy and capability of citizen science in that response. So CSIRO were asked to, to hold two fora and that the people that attended those two fora um, came from a citizen science background and a paid science background but there was a fair amount of uh, administrators among those paid scientists rather than actually doers um, but they came up with uh, the role that they thought that citizen science should have that basically they saw two key 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 roles the first role was largely for people um, who were out there in the burnt areas and they could collect field data and make observations. The second role was seen as a role that could be done by anybody in the world and that was to classify, interpret and validate the data. The overall, um, I might be picking the, the part out of the, the talk that I agree with most, but basically, they said that the greatest scientific benefit is to embed citizen science capability and energy within a research-led experimental design. And actually, I, I think that's spot on. Um, and the way, the means that they thought that we can start to progress towards achieving that was to establish a central register of those fire projects that are out there so that citizens can see and choose to be involved that we should highlight and um, showcase some really good collaborative examples. And also, we need to identify for the citizen science, the data tools that are out there for people to use um, and, and produce science. There actually were 10 recommendations. So I've just picked a few, so you should read the document if you're interested in it further. So let's look at that central register. and. Um, there were basically 23 uh, projects on that, on that register of which 18 deal with wildlife. Now, only two 
are based within a university. The majority of projects are run by people like me, employed people within the state government or territory organisations, e ecologists who have, we've got a, a, you know, a pay for the, our working lives, a set job. We're not under the pressures that some of the academics are under. Um, I can really only speak for myself, but why I became involved in citizen science initially was the lure of uh, you know free workers, uh, and by being involved with that, I've realised that um, there's just so much expertise out there, and literally, I, I do have now four thousand people out there helping me do my job, and because I've got that behind me, it actually makes me look pretty good. Um, so I think that's probably motivation for a lot of the projects, but you know, why are there only two uni projects? And when you look at the wildlife projects that are on the bushfire uh, finder, they have a fairly narrow focus. And look, I'm involved in three of those projects fairly heavily, so I can say that as a criticism. criticism. Um, so of, of the 18 wildlife, eight basically are just asking people to randomly take photographs or record sound images of wildlife that's out there and send that into a site. Now, I'm pretty heavily involved in uh, Canberra Nature Map uh, down the bottom here. And I just want to show, I'm not bagging what you can achieve from just that random people taking photographs because it actually has transformed the way we do conservation in the ACT. Um, over the first, over 110 years of botanical effort in the ACT, we had about 2,500 records of, of rare plants. In six years, with uh, citizen science using the Canberra Nature Map, just putting in random photos, that number would be up to 7,000 species, uh, 7,000 records now, but actually we took 15% of the rare plants off the list because they are more common than we thought. Um, and similarly for uh, threatened species, for about a third of the threatened species in the ACT, just by people putting up those random photos, we've actually doubled the number of known populations or known species numbers. This one down here, the Canberra spider orchid, it's a case in point. Um, we actually paid $10,000 to a, an expert scientist to come up with, to do some survey and find some new populations for us and we got nothing for our money. We didn't even ask citizen science to start sending in photos, but they did. And we actually have, like, they have located three new populations and the number of the plants have gone from 200 to 800. We've also had, uh, Species that we thought extinct, such as this metallic green carpenter bee, uh, actually be rediscovered. Uh, several new species, like this Calpurnian cricket. And on over 150 occasions, um, people by putting in their photos, it's actually the first record of a high risk invasive species in a particular reserve, the ACT, mainland Australia, or in one case, Australia. And it's enabled us to go out and eradicate those weeds or pests while they're still in low numbers. As an example, we've had cooler tie grass and um, African fountain grass uh, reported via Nature Mapper, and it's only been a handful of plants. So we've been able to eradicate those. Had we had this in place 20 years ago, when similarly African love grass and Chilean needle grass arrived in the ACT, we're now spending $200,000 a year controlling those plants. So it actually does make a big difference. But what I would like is the fire response to take us beyond just looking at species distribution and abundance and starting to get into to wider questions. Three of the, pro well, four of the projects on that finder uh, do target species. Two of them are just asking for people to take uh, photos of koalas and glossy black cockatoos and, and not much else. I really like the Echidna CSI project because it is asking people to send in photos uh, and locations for echidnas so they can look at the national abundance and distribution of it. Um, and they've had, I think, something like 
4,000 um, uh, sightings put in, but also to ask people to send a scat. So, and from the echidna poo, they can actually judge from the DNA um, the relationship of, of particular echidnas in particular parts of Australia. And um, also from the DNA, they can work out the DNA of the species that they've been eating. And from the hormones that are in the poo, they can also work out the reproductive uh, state of the echidna and whether they're under stress. So just by asking people for poo, they can actually see, you know, how stressed are echidnas post-fire? How long does that last? So that's a, a, a pretty good project. The um, Victoria uh, bushfire response now, again, I think they're a bit like us. They're caught between two worlds of not actually wanting to put people out into dangerous situations. So they haven't really developed this project uh, too far yet, but basically, the thrust of it is to get people to tag, to go out and look for particular threatened species and try to give uh, fill out information on their post fire response. And I've got a, a similar thing, and I know Derek's listening, and um, this is something that I'd like to do. Look, we nearly escaped the bullet in the ACT of, of burns until we had the defence come and help us. And then they started a burn that burnt 85,000 hectares. Um, and that for 118 of our rare species, more than 50% of their known ACT population was in that burn area. For 68 of those, um, all of their population was in the burn area. And for most of them, we've got no idea how they respond to fire. We do know that for this one, this Dampiria, uh, Kaijura Dampiria, it actually does uh, quite well after fire, but for others such as the small snake orchid, we've got really no idea at all. Um, and the idea is to ask citizen science to go to known locations and just say, what's happened after fire? Are they, have they come up? Um, have they increased? Have populations declined? And one of the advantages of tying in citizen science, particularly um, orchid lovers, is actually they know where these plants are and people like myself have, haven't got much of a clue. And even though we might have a GPS, we can go out and it's pretty hard to actually say, oh, am I in the right spot if you don't see something? Whereas if someone knows, oh yeah, it's by that funny looking rock where this location is, um, it's a lot more efficient. So I'd like to do that. And also some of the tools from all those sites actually can build up time, uh, time lags of, of what's happening. So you've got a, a time scale of each time we go out to take a photo and you can record the abundance. So we start to see a, a history of that site and how it responds to fire. Some of the um, target questions, they don't have to be complex. They can be um, fairly simple, but very elegant. And this is one of my favorite projects. Um, it's uh, Marimbula star here, it's a very, endangered and restricted a shrub. Its stronghold is at Tura Beach down on the south coast. Um, and there was a question, no one knew how it was pollinated, whether it was pollinated by specialists, and if it was, then decline in those specialists could have a dire impact on the plant, or um, whether it was generalist. So um, the question was how it's pollinated, and the easiest way to tell that is just to go and look and take photos of the insects. But actually they got expert advice from Dr. Roger, Roger Farrow, who basically told them what to look out for. And they sound fairly simple, but it's good to have someone with that expertise giving an overall project design. And he said, you need to look to see whether the insects are moving from one shrub to another. You need to see whether actually their body is connecting with the pollen in the plant or whether they're just visiting the, the plant without touching the pollen and whether the pollen sticks to the insect. So people were recording that and the, and the good news is that uh, it, it's a generalist and they had um, over 130 insect records uh, for that plant. Uh, now Roger will produce a paper which will, which will say that and the D OEH, who, uh, Office of Environment, the, my colleagues in New South Wales, equivalent to Parks, um, They'll use that information 
to know, oh yeah, we don't have to worry too much about the pollinators, that's okay. But Roger will go away and he'll write his paper and that, that will be it. But he had 20 people helping him who lived down on Tura Beach. They'll be there and they'll be checking. Have the seeds, has it produced viable seeds? Are they being attacked by predators? Um, so there's this ongoing understanding that once you've started something, it just keeps going. I now want to go, I'm going to tell you three stories. And for those of you who don't like uh, bedtime stories, um, you can try and uh, amuse yourself by guessing uh, what the connection to fire is. So each of the three stories has a fire. And why I like these stories is that it actually shows that citizens can actually be the start of projects. We don't need to sit back and wait for people like myself to start a project or for the universities. We can take projects to the universities. So this story began by a friend of mine called Matthew Higgins, who now lives down the South Coast, but was living in a suburb of, of uh, Ainsley in Canberra. He was walking around the local bush and thought he saw signs of this uh, goanna, Rosenberg's goanna. Now, up until 2015, we thought Rosenberg's, if they occurred in the ACT, we were talking very few, you know, only a handful of individuals and only in remote areas. So Matthew persisted and actually right on the edge of Canberra's uh, urban, or on Canberra's urban edge, he found these two pair who he dubbed Rosie and Rex mating. He contacted a colleague of mine, Don Fletcher, and they put up a wildlife camera over a termite mound. The female goanna lays its eggs in the termite mound, which keeps the eggs at a certain temperature. Um, and the eggs hatched. And Matthew um, put out great photos and was a star in the media. Um, Matthew and Don were thinking about, they'd like to do the study, but they were um, unsure. They didn't think there were enough um, animals on that Mount Aisley, Mount Majura area to, to have a study. But after Matthew's splash in the media, um, on Canberra Nature Map, we started people saying, ah, that Matthew Higgins, he doesn't know what he's talking about. They're not rare. They're coming to my truck yard every, you know, every day or they're sunbathing on my patio and uh, people started putting records on Canberra Nature Map. Um, from, from 1970 to 2015, we actually have 28 Rosenberg's records in the ACT. Within two weeks of Matthew's stories, that number had been taken up to 67. And there was a concentration of those records down in the Nass Valley down in the southern part of the ACT. So Don wanted to know, oh, perhaps we could do our study in the Nass Valley. So he uh, put out 19 baits. And at 16 of those baits, he had these leaping lizards. Um, so obviously there was a big population. Now at that time, two scientists who were associated with Canberra University, um, Enzo Gorino and uh, uh, Brian Green uh, heard about uh, what Don and Matthew were doing and asked if they could join. So they brought expertise which helped with animal ethics in terms of handling goannas, helped with the research design in terms of tracking and um, also the analysis of the data that was coming from that tracking. So they set up a trapping program, they trapped 65 lizards uh, and marked them. From that trap release program, they worked out the density of lizards, the total population, probably around 80 lizards um, down in this valley. And they actually came up with information that was at odds with what we actually thought about this lizard. So it, for most of the time over summer, it's, each lizard has a foraging range between 50 and 70 hectares. They, uh, were found in areas where there weren't termite mounds. So because of that relationship that the eggs need to be put in a termite mound, our advice had always been that if you're looking for Rosenbergs, they're not going to be where they're not termites. But actually there were, the study found that they were using areas where there weren't termites, but they would go on these um, up to 12 kilometre trips 
uh, into what are probably breeding areas. And they've also found that they'll have overwintering sites at another location. Uh, so the story is quite complex and the management um, is, it's providing us a good ecological basis for, for managing this particular species. And it's come out of just scientific curiosity originally by citizens and then joining in, in forces with scientists. Now, if you worked out what the uh, fire connection is for this story, uh, this area down here was the same area that was burnt um, by the Aurora Valley fire that, that when I spoke about earlier. Um, and they actually have recovered, they had, they had eight trackers on eight animals which were burnt. Uh, the good news was the animals just went to ground and survived, mainly, and they recovered six of the trackers. This is uh, remains and you can just sort of make out the tracker on an animal that was found. It wasn't burnt, whether death was related to post-fire starvation, it's, it's unclear, or just normal death. But basically they now have pre-data and they will have post-data, a uh, post-fire data to compare. So that's a, a pretty amazing story. The next story I want to tell you about is, um, this is a small ant blue butterfly. This particular photo up here in the corner, it was taken by Christine uh, Darwood. Um, and at that time, this butterfly hadn't been seen in the ACT for over a decade. And it's actually laying an egg. And there hadn't been any known breeding sites again for a decade anywhere in Australia and those the most recent ones it was thought that they were extinct in Victoria. Now it has been seen up in northern Australia so it probably does have breeding sites up there but in the southern half of Australia this was the only known breeding site. So the person that the way Cameron HMAT works you put in a photo and there's a group of volunteer experts who identify it for you. Susie Bond the butterfly expert she got really excited um, and the question was, well, how many breeding sites do we actually have in the ACT? Now, this butterfly has a pretty amazing relationship with an ant called the coconut ant, which is called the coconut ant because when you squash it, it smells like coconut oil. The caterpillar of the butterfly, the butterfly lays its eggs, as you can see on a trunk. The caterpillar, the ant collects the eggs and takes the eggs into its nest. The caterpillar eats, eats the larvae of the um, the coconut ant and the coconut ant in return milks the caterpillar for particular amino acids. The nest of the kangaroo of the coconut ant is pretty distinctive because it's mostly got this mixture of sort of cardboard texture and dirt. It's called a frass, and you can readily see those. So we asked people through CAM and HMAP to keep their eyes out for the coconut ant nests, and we had um, over um, 400 nests identified by people. We then asked a group to be trained to look for pupae and eggs and the caterpillar of the, the butterfly to, and to concentrate it on those areas where the uh, coconut ant nests have been identified. So through that citizen science, we also, um, Susie wrote in John Lewis, an ant expert to help us with coconut ant identification. And he asked, he set us a task of collecting a certain number of ants from each site. And from that, we actually identified a new species of coconut ant. Um, and actually the butterflies do seem to be associated with both species. Um, Citizen Science looking for these eggs and pupae found we're up to six sites. And up until this project, if people saw two or three butterflies together, they got pretty excited. They do this thing called hilltopping. Butterflies don't have dating apps. So they head for the highest point in the landscape to meet up with each other. But also when the, the females emerge from a coconut ant nest, the males are waiting nearby. And all these little dots here are, are, are butterflies. And we, we had 
literally over over 100 butterflies. It was just so much more than I've ever seen before. So not only have we discovered the six only known global breeding sites, we've established the largest one. And by having people out there who have plenty of time, uh, they made observations. So there's a whole lot of ecology about this butterfly known, which isn't. And I'll just leave you with this one gruesome fact, which was as soon as the female has finished laying her eggs, a coconut ants actually butcher and take her apart and take her remains back into the nest. So it's a, yeah, you wouldn't want either of them as your friends. The last example I, I want to talk through is uh, about uh, the gang gang. This project started from a group of residents uh, in use and there's a proposal to uh, build a, a storage uh, facility right next to their houses, which they didn't want. And in the place where they were going to put the facility was a, a nest tree that they discovered of a gang gang. At that time, there was only one other nest tree known in the whole of the ACT. The gang gang population in the ACT is stable, but in New South Wales, the population has dropped 30% in the last few decades and it's listed as a threatened species. So I said, well, look, yeah, it's probably important, but it'd be really good if we had the context to argue why this development shouldn't go ahead. So look, how many gang gang nesting sites are there out there? So basically we asked people to um, record any time they saw gang gangs going in and out of hollows and to send that information to us. And again, we had um, over 400 different trees recognised in which gang gangs were showing an interest. We then narrowed that down to trees in which gang gangs had, of both sexes showed a multiple interest and that uh, came to 69 trees. So we then had a recording sheet and we asked people to watch the, um, the trees for at least 20 minutes on at least four occasions. Um, and citizen science being citizen science, not only did I watch the 69 trees, but ended up watching 149 trees in total um, and making 864 20 minute observations, which is a pretty big effort. And from that, uh, we actually found uh, 16 nest trees uh, in one breeding season and in total now we're up to 21 nest trees. And from that, we've actually worked out um, some things about the gang gangs. So they actually do like to nest, the nests are found close together. So within this original site, there were seven other nests within 500 metres. So that was really good context for saying that development shouldn't go ahead and it hasn't. Um, the, uh, all the nests were within 200 metres of the urban edge and they seem to be close to uh, eucalypt plantings with large pods, mainly um, Sydney bluegums. Also, surprisingly, the hollows are very shallow. So the um, depth of the hollows range from 22 centimetres to 90 with an average depth of about 50 centimetres. Now, I wish this was a live audience because I could pose a question to you. Um, what age do you think the youngest tree was that had a, a gang gang breeding in it. And I bet no one would have said that it was 57 years and it was a planted tree. So on three occasions, we had trees that were planted with hollows that gang gangs were using, which is good news. The hollows in those younger trees is different generally to the hollows in the remnant tree. So they're actually formed by the branch is splitting or you have been, um, in one case, a, a branch was sawn off um, for, for horticultural purposes. Water then gets in and fungus sort of softens the wood and the gang gangs threw it out. Now, why I'm asking that, if, if you look at this photo here carefully, you can sort of see this grey mass here and down here there's, there's a dead bird on the ground. Um, on two of the occasions, uh, Basically, we observed 
what's happening here is, is the, this adult is uh, removing a dead gang gang chick from the nest. The chick wasn't damaged in any way and we expect, we were wondering whether it was heat exhaustion or potentially, because the hollows are, sh uh, are shallow, if it rains heavily, they do fill up with water. So potentially that they could have drowned. Um, and this gang gang we found at the base of a tree, but it was pretty smelly. So it probably died about a week before we found it. Again, no obvious damage. Um, if, if, if we look at this chart, the dotted line is the maximum temperature on a particular day ever recorded in Canberra. And this is the temperatures we had recorded this year. So you can see that over a 25 day period, we had 10 days that were the hottest day ever reported, report, recorded in Canberra. And we had um, dead chicks here. And this one that died, um, probably uh, the timeline corresponds with this hottest day we've ever experienced in Canberra, which was just under 45 degrees. Um, so we suspect that perhaps those hollows which are formed by in these planted trees don't have as good insulation. So um, the next stage is to, we're linking up with uh, ANU, uh, P, hoping to get a PhD student um, through Rob Heinchen. Um, and we hope to put thermometers in some of these to test it and potentially we could insulate some of those trees if that was the issue. So what's the connection with the fire? Well, part of that, well, one of the reasons we, we want to look at why are they declining elsewhere and not in the Canberra region. Um, so we want to head out to the rural areas and the gang gang is a cool temperate uh, species. It's actually one of the, the only cockatoos that, that is. Um, and over 50% of its range was recently burned in the fires. Now, because we've got uh, a group of um, citizen science out there who are trained at looking at um, gang gangs, the researchers at ANU now have a team of 57 people that are happy to go out and look for nests out in those remote areas. Um, so we'll start putting that story, which will make a difference to gang gang con conversation, con conservation. I've got a, um, the other uh, main sort of line of, of work that's on the wildlife finder is camera traps. There are three projects, two of them through the Australian Museum and one where our cameras are put out to landowners. The museum actually has a, a, a host of projects nested within them and they generally work like this. You're given an image, you're asked, there's a tutorial which you go by and you're asked to uh, classify that animal. Um, and in this case, on Kangaroo Island, they've collected their images, um, 15,000 records uh, over three weeks have been analysed and they're using that to actually find out Whereabouts is the Kangaroo Island Dunnut surviving and are actually where are things like cats and pigs that they can concentrate control. So it's got uh, direct relevance. You could say that, um, yeah, you could have used AI or, you know, 15,000 is not much to go by, but this is a project that it's got half, um, half a million images and we're actually getting people to not only record what animals are there, but their behaviour. Um, and out of, in that one of the half a million images was this starling removing a, a superb parrot's egg, which is the sort of the only proof that starlings directly do um, destroy the nests of uh, superb parrots. And this is actually a brush tail uh, possum munching on a rosella. That year, the rosellas had actually taken over the, the superb parrot's nest from the previous year. So that's, uh, again, useful information that anybody at can provide. The other three remaining projects, one of them is about uh, shelter belt planting and um, looking at how shelter belts responded to fire and how they're coming back. So in the future, they can fireproof shelter belt plantings as best they can. The bell miner up on the north coast, it tends to be favoured by areas where there's thick undergrowth. So they're looking at ways of 
what happens when you control that undergrowth and different ways of controlling it. So that includes also areas that have been burnt. This uh, New South Wales uh, bushfire risk hub, it's um, looking at, um, it's mapped the fire intensity across New South Wales and it wants people to ground truth um, their mapping by taking photos and making observations on sheets. There, that work is still, um, because of the risk of putting bushfires out, it's still in its early stages. One project that, that none of them out there that I'd like just to, to run briefly about is, and I think it's a role for the scientists, is actually to come out with these stratified um, experimental designs, which basically say across the environment where, that we're interested in a particular feature, and we're gonna put sample plots in this location and we want you to go and collect data. So here um, is an experiment where uh, we were worried about the effect of prescribed burning on the orchids of a particular geology, Black Mountain Sandstone, and uh, 110 plots were put out um, and people adopted a plot. And over two, uh, two separate two week periods, they were asked to photograph any orchid within 50 metres of the plot. Those photographs were identified by experts. Uh, we got tens of thousands of, of records and just having all those people out on the ground meant that we could be at a time when orchids were flowering. The results were that most orchids were uh, doing okay in that fire regime. Some like the um, Black Mountain uh, donkey orchid, which is basically endemic to that or area and this, um, beard orchid, they were actually favoured by frequent fire, but other orchids like uh, brown beaks and this uh, mountain greenhood, they were only found in the long unburnt areas. So the work has led to um, a more nuanced fire program. But I think that way of stratifying and getting people to sample is a good way. Another example is uh, Frog Watch, which has people sending in sound recordings from uh, dams and ponds and wetlands all over our region and people have stratified those points according to um, distance from the urban edge, the quality of water, the type of uh, uh, urban uh, device that's there to, to control urban stormwater runoff um, and that's led to uh, information about how, how to be, better look after our frogs and also what frogs can tell us about the environment. So I think, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty good examples of ways to, to move. The last um, sort of type of project that I think we can have this collaboration of science and citizen relates to rescue and relocation. So the example I've got is um, there's a predator-proof fence around Mulligan's Flat and Long nose, uh, long neck turtles were, were basically getting st stuck on the fence. So it was decided to get people to go out, record where they record the turtle, whether it was on the inside or outside of the fence, and basically to, to aid it through. And what that has meant that they can focus where they need to put devices to, to, to turtles to get under the fence at those key locations. Look, there aren't any projects that I've been involved in. I'm pretty sure they exist somewhere, but there's the opportunity for when people are out there and they're really concerned about saving um, wildlife like, like this greater glider in a burnt area, and they might be relocating it to an area to at least record where that animal has been collected from, so that's known, but also to give um, advice about where. Um, where areas that, that, that wildlife might survive, in particular fires to go out, and also what's the long story record in terms of relocating those animals. So just to conclude, I'm hoping that the talk has inspired some of you to really take serious that collaboration between paid and the expertise that paid scientists have and the access to some of the equipment 
with the enthusiasm and the capability of citizen science. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and hope it has been a, some inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Very, a very informative presentation. Um, can I just remind people if they've got questions, if they could please enter them into the, um, the chat box. Um, we have one from Diana at this stage. Um, are these apps to download on your phone or websites? Uh, usually they, they work both ways. You'll find that about 15 to 20 percent of the people use the apps and the rest are, are on the website. But yeah, um, go to the Citizen Science uh, Project Finder um, and, and the links are through that way and, and you can either download the apps or use the computer. Actually, I've got a confession, I don't own a mobile phone, so I'm just totally uh, computer based. Fair enough. Um, Diana goes on to say, a fantastic presentation, so informative and thoroughly enjoyable. Um, you, I've got a, a question, if I may. Um, in terms, you said the, the three stories that you told all had a relationship to the fires. You, you specifically mentioned the, the, um, the first and the last, but I don't recall hearing what the, the fires had to do with the ants and the butterflies. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening and thanks for that question. Yes, I, I thought someone, you would have worked it out that basically the, uh, the home of the coconut ant is that fallen timber, which is very prone to being lost in fires. So actually those breeding sites are now an asset which we protect during fires. And we actually cancelled a prescribed burn uh, because we were going to burn it before we knew it was uh, a, a really great breeding site for that butterfly. So um, yeah, that, that's the relationship. Fair enough. Um, and you've had a long experience with engaging with uh, citizen science and so forth. And you were talking about the, the forums that the CSIRO ran for the post bushfire things. Have you got any suggestions on how we might encourage um, the engagement between citizen science and the, the formal sciences? I think it's through examples. Um, look, I don't think the Commonwealth doesn't, government or, or even the New South Wales government through its Heritage Trust has, has, has done it well. There have been funding projects that actually examine us or examine citizen science and what motivates us. When I mean, really, I think what's going to kickstart this is really good examples of things out there and scientists will come to it and it will just make their work so much more efficient that they'll want to get involved. Um, yeah, so I think if, like with that gang gang story that started with those uh, huge residents, and we got data together and a group of people and we took the package to Rob Hynchen and you know, he fell over himself saying, yes, I want to be involved in this. Um, so I think that's, that's the way. Fair enough. Um, just one from Tam Connor. Uh, do we have a, a strategy to engage more with the universities? Uh, look, the Citizen Science Association as a whole does. Um, and look, there are, there are universities involved and there are some pretty good projects. I think a lot, a lot of the work that comes out of the universities is, is, is from groups that have been set up specifically for citizen science, whereas really I think it's going to work when it's, we're just seen as, as, as part of the, one of the options that, that any scientist can, can tap into. Um, yeah, I, I have been knocking on the doors of scientists and, and saying, can you get involved in this um, with, with mixed response? <laughs> Fair enough. Is there anyone that has any further questions? Um, if, at this stage, if you're happy to ask questions, um, by all means, unmute and, and then ask your questions verbally. So I'll take this opportunity to uh, uh, encourage those that may not be members of the Australian Citizen Science Association to become so. Um, keeps everyone informed and we can have presentations like this and get, get Michael and others to tell us what's going on. So are there any more questions, folks? Hi, it's Diana. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, lovely. Um, to 
get involved, the best thing to do is to get onto the website I'm taking it and actually sort of sign up and see what's available. Yeah, look, if you don't have a project in the back of your head already, um, yeah, I'd go through those 18 projects and decide which one interests you the most. And look, some of them, like the wildlife cameras, you, you can just 10 minutes and that helps, you know. Um, so, yeah, you, you can teach yourself about mountain possums or kangaroo island donuts um, and, their, and their fire response. It's actually pretty exciting opportunities. So, are there any further questions, ladies and gents? Yeah. If there's no other questions, what I might do is I might call the, uh, the session to a halt and I'd like to thank um, Michael for his well presented, um, uh, for his good, you know, nice presentation, good presentation. Um, I found it most informative and I hope everyone else did too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you everyone you for might. coming. I will make the, um, the presentation available um, beyond um, probably tomorrow and I'll email, email out a link to people so they can access it that way. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.